we're going to actually finish the dream series today. Um, some of you uh, would say it's about time. Uh, some of you would say, why so fast? Uh, uh, but we're going we're gonna to end with the last dream builder and dream buster, which is flying. Um, today's dream builder is learning to fly, and consequently, the dream buster is not flying, which means you hit the ground, and it hurts. If you, if you get pushed out of the nest like every baby bird does, and you don't fly, you will hit the ground. Uh, but if you learn to fly, you will soar, and God will do incredible things. This morning, I'm going to share a, a very familiar story. I'm, I'm certain I've talked about it uh, probably multiple times. I know I talked about it when I was the youth pastor of some of these now adults uh, because I was a youth pastor a long time ago. Um, but I want, to, I want to share the story of Daniel this morning and, and specifically Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Uh, but we're going to start with Philippians 3. Philippians 3.13, this has been our foundation passage of Scripture. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is, this is what I want you to hear. God's got something for you, and you can't accomplish it living in the past. You've got to move forward. If you're living in the past, it ain't going to happen. You gotta take your eye. It's okay to, to learn from the past. I'm not telling you to not ever look back. I'm not telling you to, to learn the things you need to learn, but if, if you're driving your car looking only in the rearview mirror, you're going to get in an accident. You've got to look out the windshield. And so as we dream, as we begin to move forward, I'm laying hold of those things which are ahead of me, and I'm letting go of those things which are behind. So we're going to look at Daniel this morning. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their journey is an absolute incredible journey because they had to learn to fly in unfortunate circumstances that were not even the consequences of their own actions. Uh, it's important to know uh, the, the captivity that Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are in with Babylon is not a result of their sin. It's a result of the generations before them, and now they just happen to be dealing with the consequences of the sin of the generations before them. And so in Daniel chapter 1, we, we will briefly read through a, a couple of verses. It says this in one one, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, if you don't know what a siege is, it's ugly. It's difficult. They surround the city, and you don't have any supplies brought in. You can't go out to get anything. And eventually what happens is you, you exit out of hunger. You're basically starved out. That's what to, to be sieged means. And then they'll come in and they'll, they'll tear the city down or they'll burn the city down or whatever damage they're going to do to destroy the city. This is what's happening in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In verse 6, uh, the, the people have been brought captive. And it says, Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. In verse 8, we learn that they are going to make a stand. They're going to make a decision that they're going to trust what the Lord has given them, and they're going to step into the dream that God has for them by not choosing not to defile themselves. It says this, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, <coughs> nor the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. In verse 11 it says, So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. And let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies as you see fit, so deal with your servants. <coughs> Excuse me. That's, by the way, where we get Daniel fast from. When you hear somebody's doing a Daniel fast, this is where it comes from. Uh, Daniel uh, said we only want to eat vegetables, fruits, those kinds of things. And so this is where the Daniel fast language comes from. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 18, we see the consequences of the stand that they took. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. <coughs> then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding, about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Now, many of you have heard this. Uh, if you've grown up in church, you probably saw 
the uh, felt boards uh, if you, uh, when you were in, in a little kid, and they would do Daniel and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's who Hananiah, Mishael, and Az- Azariah is, by the way. Um, so, so they've made this decision. They've made a conscious decision. They're going to live for the Lord. They're not going to defile themselves as they walk this out in this horrible circumstances of being captive in Babylon. The dream they have is honor the Lord, even in the midst of really bad circumstances, obey the commands of the Lord, even when it doesn't make sense, and finally, not let their current culture taint the faith within them. That's pretty significant because our culture tries to taint our faith all the time. Uh, when we, even when we were at Disney, we went to the, uh, the Disney Junior show, and there was all kinds of things in there that I wouldn't let my kid watch. And I'm just like, what in the world? Vampires and <clears throat> all kinds of stuff like that. Is there a bottle of water somewhere I can get? Sorry, I'm just congested today. Um, and I was thinking to myself, they're indoctrinating our kids at, John, at TJ's age, at two and a half. And I, I couldn't believe some of the things that, and, and if your kids watch these shows, I'm not, I'm not placing judgment. I, I'm not, uh, maybe that's what you will feel. I, I, I'm not trying to do that. I'm not letting my kid watch these shows. It's not going to happen. I, we're not going to, we're not going to watch shows that encourage lifestyles that are contrary to the word of God. And that's what some of the, thank you very much. That's what some of these, these shows were about. And, and Daniel here is making the decision. He's not going to be tainted by the culture. The culture was they wanted to indoctrinate him. They gave them all new names. You've heard this before. They gave them all new names. They had them learn their, their uh, ideology. They had them learn their education so that they would be indoctrinated into their culture. And then they were trying to indoctrinate their physical body with the foods and the drink that they would take. And Daniel took a stand there. He couldn't help them when they changed their name. He didn't have a choice. They were going to call him by the new name whether he liked it or not. They, they did learn the information, and it, and it put them in a place of, of significance in the administration of, of all the kings after that. But he wasn't going to defile his body. In chapter 3, uh, which is where we, we learn about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I don't know why in Daniel 1 they're Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and in Daniel 3 they have their Babylonian names, which is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Unfortunately, most of the church world actually only knows Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but that's their Babylonian name. Their God-given name was Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And, and honestly, I think it's important that we call them by that name. I think that's significant because it's part of the indoctrination that, that was trying to take place during that time. In Daniel chapter 3, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar builds this giant statue. This statue is, says it's six cubits wide and six cubits tall. In case you want to know how big that is, that's nine feet wide and nine feet tall. It's a big old statue. And here's the command. When you hear the music, you have to bow down. Everybody in the entire kingdom, when you hear the music play, your responsibility is to bow down and worship this, this idol. Culture says to bow down to false gods all the time. Faith says that's a sin. Now you have a choice. Do you fly or do you crash? They were being pushed out of the nest when they decided to make it known they would not defile themselves for the king in chapter 1. And as we move forward into chapter 3, they are really tasked with, will they do this or not? Everyone's supposed to bow down. Everyone. Everyone's supposed to worship. Everyone. Every time the music is played. This is, this is a uh, very much an egotistical thing that Nebuchadnezzar has done. So Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, we see in Daniel chapter 3, verse 6, the command, whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So what's the consequence? If you don't bow down, you're getting thrown into the fiery furnace. Now, everybody who knows the story uh, knows the ending, but we will get there in just a minute. If you don't know the ending, this is an incredible story. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah decide not to engage that command. I don't know about you, but if... uh, you lived in a, an authoritative a society like they did. It was immediate death if you didn't do what the king said. And they made the decision that the king of kings was more important than the king. Other leaders saw that they would not bow down, and what did they do? They went and told on them. Why did they go and tell on them? Because they were jealous. Honestly, 
Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael had risen in power. They had risen in authority. Daniel did as well. And by the way, I don't believe Daniel bowed. I don't know why he's not mentioned in Daniel chapter 3. He's still alive. He's still functioning. Uh, but for whatever reason, he must have not been in town that day because he's not mentioned. Uh, but he didn't bow down. You need to know Daniel did not violate the, the command of the Lord. The king was mad to say the least. We see in, in verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar in rage and fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Nebuchadnezzar is he's furious. And, and he brings them into the kingdom. He brings them into the palace. He brings them into his throne room, wherever they're at. And I can only imagine he's sitting on his throne and he says, really, guys, I've, 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 you've risen in power, you've risen in authority, you're going to defile this one thing that I'm asking you to do? Are you really not doing this thing? Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael say this to the king in verse um, 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Right there, they could have been killed. I mean, you should just understand, that sentence alone could have meant imminent death. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But, and this is, this is significant, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, we did not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. When I was um, a youth pastor, I said, that's a big butt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it gets a good laugh from the teenagers. It is a big butt. But it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter the outcome. You need to understand this one thing. We didn't bow down. We kept our, our faith. We kept our principles. We made the decision we were going to serve God and we were not going to defile ourselves. And here we are today and you've called us in here and it doesn't matter what you say. But even if he doesn't, I believe he's going to save us. I believe he's going to rescue us. But even if he doesn't, you need to know we went down not bowing down to you. I would imagine that made the king not so happy. And talk about being pushed out of the nest. Of course, the king is mad. In, in verse 19, it says, Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. I, I don't even know, because we don't live in a, a society that has a king. I don't even know that I can really grasp what that means. He was full of fury. But understand, it's not just like dad being mad. This is, this is serious. And the expression on his face changed. The fact that Scripture gives that detail, this is like almost demonic. I'm not telling you it was demonic. I'm telling you if you've ever been in a situation where there's been a demonic presence, you know something changes in that moment, in that minute. And you cannot, it's not just, it's not just in what they're saying. You can see it on their face. You can see it in their demeanor. It's like there's just this switch. You've seen it in the movies. I know you've seen it in the movies. Don't go see those movies. Don't. I'm serious. We don't even like watching the commercials. Like, we'll change it because I'm not letting that into my home. I'm not, I'm not opening up my spirit. Th those poltergeist movies and all of these movies that are all demonic and trying to scare you, it's not worth it. Don't go see them. Uh, that's a side note. Sorry. <clears throat> I think, what, what's the movie where the little girl's head spins around? Exorcist? I think that's what happened with the king here. Now, not literally, but imagine that. That's what happened with the king. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. It wasn't just bad enough to kill him. He's killing them seven times bad. I'm going to kill you, bring you back, and kill you again. That's what, he's, that's what he's saying here. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments. 
and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. But the story doesn't end there. How many of you are glad the story doesn't end there? Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the guys that had to carry them up, the I would guess three guys, maybe it was more, who are, you know, they're, they're bound, so maybe they're walking like this, I don't know, and, and they get them there and they, they go to push them in, those three guys die. It's so hot, the fire is, it's so large that those three guys died just throwing him into the furnace. Verse 23, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, I would imagine. And he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. What an incredible miracle. Listen, they didn't, they didn't only not die for really good English right there. The fire was a real fire. The other three guys, or however many were, did die. The fire was real enough to burn the things that were binding them. Because now they're walking around freely. They couldn't do that when they were thrown in. The fire was very real fire. But the one that was like the Son of God had got into the furnace with them when they, were, when they took the stand that they weren't going to bow down, when they took the stand that they were going to live for Christ, when they took the stand that they were going to fulfill the dream that God had given in their life, God surrounded them. And in the midst of the attack, in the midst of learning to have to fly, they didn't hit the ground. The Lord protected them. They didn't bow. They didn't die. They didn't even smell like smoke, Scripture says. That's pretty incredible because we build campfires. We have a fire pit in our backyard, and we'll build a campfire, and our house inside smells like fire. They didn't even smell like fire. Go to hard eight. Let me get you hungry. Go to hard eight. Stand in that line. You're going to smell like fire. You didn't even get near it. These guys didn't even smell like fire, yet they've been thrown, and they've been walking around in the midst of it. And I love that the king describes the, the one as one with the form of the Son of God. Whether it was an angel or whether it was Jesus, I don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is he was prote- they were protected. Now, this is what I, you, you know Squints in, in uh, Sandlot? He's always going like this, and, he's, and then he'll go like this again, and he's trying to clean his glass. That's what I think the king was doing. He's like, what in the world? What? I thought we only put three guys in there. King Nebuchadnezzar squints Palladorus. But you know what happens? They come out of the fiery furnace when they get called out, and they give God glory. And you know what else happens? The king gives God glory, which is incredible. If you want a, um, uh, let me say this the right way. If you want a opinion, Scripture says no man knows if, if you go to heaven or hell, right? Like, I'm not the judge. I don't get to make those decisions. I can look at your fruit and make an assumption, but I'm not the judge. If I read scripture, if for any of the theologians in the room, don't get mad at me when I make this next statement. I think Nebuchadnezzar is in heaven. I really do. I believe the forgiveness of God is so big, and the way that Nebuchadnezzar gives God glory at the end of his life, I can't help but think we might see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven, which is really an incredible thing because he was a rotten man. And he did a lot of really bad things. I'm not saying he's in heaven. I'm saying don't be surprised if you see him there. Because he stops doing what he's doing and he gives God glory before he dies. And it's an incredible, Daniel chapter 3 is not where he dies. It's, it's later in Daniel where we read about his death. But in, the, in, the, in Daniel chapter 1, he gives God glory in Daniel chapter. He doesn't learn from his mistakes. He keeps going back. He keeps having this problem with, uh, uh, with pride because you see it in chapter 1, you see it in chapter 3, you see it again in, in uh, chapter 4 when, when he has to walk around like a cow for seven years. That's an interesting story. Go read that one. 
it's what it says. I'm not, you go read it. But in the end, he gives God glory because God showed himself faithful to Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. And as a result of them taking the stand to live the way God called them to live, to live the dream that God called them to dream, it affects other people. There are times when your dream is going to cause you to have to be thrown into the fire. Maybe not a literal fire, but it's going to feel like it. The question I have for you this morning is what happens if there's not someone there with the form of the Son of God? I mean, in Daniel 6, Daniel is rescued from the lion's den. In Daniel 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are rescued from the fiery furnace. But if you read Hebrews chapter 11, there was a lot of martyrs. There was a lot of people who died for their faith. So Daniel 3 and Daniel 6 are not the norm. In fact, I would suggest Hebrews 11 is the norm. This earth, this is my earthly body. This is a temporary form. My heavenly body is the one that's going to last forever. And by the way, heaven is the prize. I don't know if anybody is walking through uh, recently the death of a loved one, or maybe you are on the cusp of, of somebody that you love maybe passing away. Let me say to you, heaven is not a penalty. Heaven is a prize. And our grieving is different. Hebrews 11 is, it's the, it's the hall of martyrs. It's all of these people who died for their faith. In the end, it says they were sawed in half. I mean, horrible things that happen to believers. This dream that I believe God's giving you, each one of you, are you willing to embrace that dream even if one like the Son of God is not standing there next to you? Are you willing to give it all up to the dream of the Lord? This morning I want to share two testimonies with you uh, and we're going to turn these mics on if we can make sure that they're on in the feed uh, so that people don't see if anybody's watching right now or watches later, uh, they don't see mouths moving and, and no sound. Um, I want Leo and Pam to come up. Leo and Pam, will you guys come up here? I'm going to give you guys these mics. Uh, Leo and Pam have uh, taken uh, steps of faith over the last six months that I think you should hear about because they've made the decision to fly. Uh, they've made the decision to stand up, and when they were kicked out of the nest by the Lord... Uh, they flew instead of letting themselves be succumbed to, to what was happening. And, and I think it's important for you to hear their dream. So I'm going to start with Pam. Pam, um, I know about your journey with Mercy House. Yes. Uh, and by the way, uh, she did an amazing job with Mercy House. And if you don't know anything about Mercy House, you need to go look it up and you need to support Mercy House. It's an incredible ministry that ministers to, to uh, young ladies who are pregnant and, and they don't have a place to go. But this isn't about Mercy House this morning. Go support them. Give your money to them. Give your time to them. Uh, spend time getting to know the ladies. They're incredible. God's doing an amazing thing in them. I can't speak highly enough about Mercy House. Pam was the director of Mercy House for how long? Three and a half years. So for the congregation's sake, because I know we, we've walked together, right. share briefly your journey with Mercy House kind of the last six months of of the time there. Just the last six months. Well, I mean, you could. She, <laughs> we're going to be done in 21 minutes. So right. you talk as long as you want, but then Leo doesn't get to talk. <laughs> in 2015, coming from Africa, my husband and I were installed as house parents over Mercy House, which meant that we lived inside the house and we ministered to the girls, and it was the joy of my life. And one year later, uh, Susan Hewlett, the founder of Mercy House, asked my husband and I to go to coffee with her. And during that coffee time, she turned to us and she shared with us that she was wanting to step back in Mercy House and appoint my husband to be the director of Mercy House. And my husband looked at me and said, and looked at her and said, no, no. <laughs> he, he could barely say the word maternity at that time. <laughs> and uh, I think he came gently into the ministry thinking, I don't know what this means for me. Anyway, he turned to me and he said, this is for Pam, this is not for me. And I received the, uh, the directorship mostly because I, it was a challenge. I knew I could do it, and I love the plight of the girls, because you're right, it's an amazing ministry. Then, about last July, I felt a change in that. 
I felt a change because Mercy House, I used to tell Pastor Ben in the hall all the time, Mercy House is my job, but it's not necessarily my primary calling. My calling is to pastor, and my calling is to minister. And as director, I did a lot of fundraising and a lot of event planning and a lot of donor. So in October, you came to me and you said you were considering resigning. Absolutely. So in July, I had those thoughts. In October, I started to talk to, it, to the board about it. Uh, if there's anybody from I the board here, to I told her not to resign. I just want everybody to know that. I tried talking her out of it uh, yes. numerous times. She, she had, we had multiple, and Rory was there too. We had multiple conversations in my office, um, in our house, in, in different uh, places where mm -hmm. I really tried talking her out of it because I thought she was doing an incredible job with Mercy House. Thank you. Um, you were pretty clear that this is what you felt you were supposed to do. So what was driving that decision? So it was the time of year that it was our uh, strategic planning at Mercy House. And I had nothing to bring to the party at that point. The Lord had started to change me in July. And I literally sat, our board meetings are, were in the boardroom here. And I sat in that board meeting. And as conversations went on, I felt God distinctly tell me, you don't have to be a part of this anymore. And I felt like if you had gone through my journal and looked in the last four years, I talked about desiring to pastor, desiring to minister in the capacity that God called me to. So, uh, Leo. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Tell me about what happened. And by the way, I know all the answers to these questions. We've walked this stuff out, but you don't. Tell me what happened last year on your way back from camp. Um, Not the whole story. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, we'll be here till next Sunday. Yeah, so the, the truck, the van needed gas. And, no, I'm just <laughs> um, we were driving back from camp, and I, uh, uh, I just felt the Lord tell me that it was time for me to, to focus on reaching people. And uh, unlike Pam, like, I just didn't have like, a moment of like, obedience with him. I just kind of like, zoned out, and, uh, and I just decided to sort of ignore him. I did, I did feel direction from him. But I didn't like. I didn't feel like anything actionable was required of me, and so I just continued to live my life, um, understanding what he told me. But like, he didn't ask me to do anything about it. So I just. So do you want to tell the congregation about your email that you sent me on December thirty first, or do you want me to tell them? I think it would just be easier. If, like, I don't know. Can you read it, or do you have? Yeah, it? I can. <laughs> I can read it to him. So, Leo is. Uh, I love Leo. <laughs> I got an email from Leo at midnight on December 31st. I did not read it till the morning of January 1st because I'm apparently old now and go to bed before midnight. I'm lucky if I make it to see the ball drop in New York. <laughs> so here's what, here's what he said in his email. This is the entire email. God gave me till tonight to tell you I'm leaving Grace to start a church this year. I can stay till May. Love you, Leo. That's the whole email. That's the entire thing. Now, my response to Leo was, not really sure why you chose to send this in an email, but since this is the route you informed me, I'll respond here. How long have you known this is something you wanted to do? Where will you be starting this church? Do you want to stay through May, or would you prefer to leave sooner? How can we pray for you and help you? And it sounds like your mind is made up, but for the sake of asking, are you positive this is what you want to do? I love you much, and it will be sad to see you and your family go. Obviously, I have many more thoughts, but not sure this is the venue for it. And this is how Leo responded. We can talk next week. I emailed you because it was midnight. <laughs> this is how every email exchange goes with Leo. God told me back in June, but so many difficult things have been going on. I've been pleading with him weekly to let me stay. During Thanksgiving, he told me, I had to tell you before the year ended or I was dead. <laughs> I'm reading this as it came to me. I hope you understand that he did not, and not is all capitalized, mean it figuratively, he was going to kill me. I waited till the last minute in case he was going to change my direction. Instead, I got almost two weeks of silence from him. I don't want to start a church. I have no plans. This makes no sense to anyone. Uh, I want to stay forever, but I'm pretty sure if I don't, God set a date God will kill me somehow. 
uh, Grace is planning this church, so welcome on board. We're calling it Unity Force Square Church. I want to live, so there's no choice but to obey. I love you way more. I really hope you don't do what you normally do and overprocess this. <laughs> you just quit and told me you were going to die. How do I not overprocess this? He then goes on to say, I'm not actually the crazy one God is. No disrespect, Father. <laughs> Happy New Year. They always start off so fun for you. This is, this is my email exchange with Leo. So, Leo. It sounded way more professional in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is how I've lived my life with Leo for the last three years. Uh, so, uh, we did meet, and Rory was there with us, so Rory can verify any part of this email that, or this exchange that he wants to verify later on. What happened when we met in my office? Um, I, uh, I hadn't shared with Pastor Ben, I had a, a dream that was, I guess, 10 years ago now. <laughs> and this is all, like, very credibly verifiable, because when I had this dream, I was working at Florence Avenue, and it was like one of those dreams that I knew immediately that it was from God. And so I went to my senior pastor. I went to my father-in-law. I went to like as many people as I could to consult about this dream. And um, everybody, like, it's just really, really frustrating, kind of like what I said when I was preaching, because I, I know God's like telling me to do stuff. And I'm like, nope. And then, and God's like very definitive with me. Like, I'm not joking. Like, I really, some of you have even heard the story. I actually almost did die one day just recently. Yeah, we shared that on a, on a Sunday morning. Yeah. And, um, like, I'm certain that had I not, and I didn't send that email at midnight. I actually typed that email, like, in November. But I said it in Microsoft Outlook to go out on December 31st. Because Leo goes to bed earlier than I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, actually, I didn't actually fully remember about the email until I got his response back on the first. I and joked so I with him since then. I should have just not responded. Just <laughs> I would have given forgot. him like a week and just seen what he'd done. <laughs> but, um, so anyhow, at the time that I had the dream, um, I had had the dream, and it was so long ago. I'm just going to be very honest with you. I had not forgotten about the dream. It just isn't something that we speak about like I don't walk around every Friday going like yeah let me tell you about my dream that I had you know and so um this dream was very troubling and at the time that I had it I was at Florence Avenue and I don't know that you guys will or won't know who Leslie Kegel is Anybody? he came and spoke here a few years ago he's, he's from, from Sri Lanka yes I was gonna say <laughs> Indonesia that would have been wrong but um so he used to come to Florence Avenue all the time and he would do like super weird stuff like prophetically preach for like an hour and just like crazy stuff that like everybody here will be like sitting there and many if not all people will hear like prophecy spoken to you but it's different to everyone and crystal he was, was healed when he was here he spoke a word over her and she was healed when he it's was here. he's a pretty crazy guy and so as, not crazy like leo you know it's like a verifiably <laughs> like good crazy <laughs> and so I was just like walking down the foyer and I like look over and Leslie Kegel was <laughs> just sitting there like in regular clothing just sitting there and so I being the way that I am I just walked over to him and I said hey I need your help and I told him the dream and the, I'll give you the bridge version of the dream in the dream I'm like picking up a piece of PVC pipe and I needed to get it into the backyard of a house. And I like looked through the gate and there was like a pile of trash. And on top of the trash was like a demonic figure. And I needed to get the PVC pipe in there and I couldn't figure out how to get it in. And so I realized like I gotta go way back into the street, like make it the skinny way and then like walk in through the gate. And as I was walking in through the gate, I was a little bit less than halfway in, this demonic figure like comes at me and I like came back out real, real far and I put the pipe down and I like, closed the door and right there in that moment, um, my son, which at the time was like weeks old, uh, shows up and he's like approximately 10 years old. I didn't verify his age, which is the age he is now. This is the part about this dream that's really, really timely. And, um, and he tells me to pick up the pipe and go through the house. 
And so I told that dream in a lot of detail to Leslie Kegel, and he said, oh, it's easy. He said, the, the reason why this task is so long is because it's something of great importance that's going to make a big effect. And he said, the reason why it's PVC and you could pick it up with one hand is because it's something that's going to be easy for you. And he said, and the reason, oh, and what Hezekiah tells me in the dream is he says, he says, dad, go through the house. And, and Leslie Kegel says, and the house is the church. He said, you've got to take this uh, responsibility that God has given you through the church. And so like super easy in my dream, I totally remember that I picked up the PVC after Hezekiah told me this. This is without the interpretation that I had received. And I just picked up the PVC and I remember I walked into the house and my dream ended. I was standing in the house with a piece, piece of PVC and I could see the pile of the backyard, the pile of the trash. And that was what my, my job was to take that piece of PVC to the back. And my dream ended there. But Leslie Kegel translated in a way that the, the task, the reason why it was PVC is because it was going to be something that was very easy for me to do. And he said, but um, the obedience and the, the order is that you have to take it in through the house. And so that's the dream that I had. So I, share that with, I shared that with Pastor Ben that morning when he confronted me about quitting. <laughs> confronted you about quitting? <clears throat> Crystal and I, many of you would know, we did a Daniel Fest at the beginning of the year. And <clears throat> during that Daniel Fest, that weekend, I, I actually pray, I've never prayed this before. Um, I prayed that we would be able to interpret dreams and we would have wisdom and we would have all of the things that Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah received at the end of Daniel chapter 1 that's referenced about them, that that would be evident in our lives. <clears throat> and so Leo shares this dream with me, and I immediately thought, that's baseball church. It, it, what you are talking about is baseball church. This is something you can do on your own, but you need to do it underneath uh, uh, the ministry of a church. And, and so I just submitted that to him, and I, and I told him then, I had just prayed, like I think on Friday, and this was Monday, that we would, we would receive the blessings that Daniel had received. And I said, so you can do with this what you want to do with this. Uh, if you want to go start a church, we'll help you go start a church. If you want to go, there's a church plant in Kaufman that's starting. I'll, I'll put you in contact with them. I want to help you get to where God wants you to be. And he was saying, well, how did you, how did you feel when I said that? Yeah, it, it totally made sense. Uh, what was really funny is, I, so <laughs> the baseball church is like a website that I randomly typed up one day at the computer. I never have looked at the ministry as like an actual church. So like to me, even though that's the language that we say and that we use, it's like what I do on the weekends. Um, I think that there's a lot of misconception that we just r discovered this past summer is that it's not like about like where my kids are playing baseball. Like we go to wherever people will take us. And sometimes, even though I'm not here at, at the church per se, and I'm doing the baseball church stuff, it's not like I'm not with my kids. Like it's, if it makes sense, it's like double the sacrifice. Like I'm both missing here and missing my family because it's something that, that we do to really, to reach people. And so I will go to where the baseball tournament is 400 kids, 600 kids, and not see my own children because that's like what, what it really is. And the I ministry that, the Lord is giving to you. Correct. And so I think that that's where when he told me that, it was like a light went on. And I was like, I've never viewed it before as like an actual, like an actual church. Well, one of the things you told me was there's, it brings legitimacy to the ministry when you are part of a church. Correct, and, and that was something that <clears throat> this summer, I've shared with you guys all before, and for those of you that haven't, I'll just briefly share, is we were out at a baseball tournament here locally in Flower Mound, and there were a lot of people there, and when we were closing it down, a gentleman came and asked me for if we would pray, if I would pray for him, and it was the, the what I told Pastor Ben is I think that in times past, the prayer request box is viewed as like, oh, this is a great idea, and thank you, and people put their prayers in it. But this gentleman came to me, and he was very, um, I, I don't know if, I don't want to say he was concerned, but I think it meant a lot to him that it was like a real church. 
Um, and so he had one of the little cards that actually say Grace Community Church, and it has our, our address and our website and stuff on it. And he asked me to pray for him. He said that um, he got a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning saying that his son had died. Um, he was in the military, and he had passed away somewhere. He didn't tell me the details. But he said, um, and he's just tearing up, and he's crying, and he said, I've got to, he said, we didn't want to tell my grandson because he's playing in the World Series today, and we didn't want it to ruin his day. And he, <coughs> sorry, he said, I, um, sometime <coughs> between now, on my way home, he said, I have to tell my grandson that his father is dead. And uh, at the time, I didn't choke up like this. <laughs> at the time, I was like, let's pray, you know, I was like really fired up about it. And we prayed for him and whatnot, <clears throat> but I felt like the reason why he was able to come to me with that is because this wasn't like Leo, some nutcase, which if you haven't met me, I'm even weirder in the, out he, there. He is actually a nutcase. <laughs> so, the card makes people think he's not. Correct. I think like the card was like, <laughs> there might be some hope that this prayer request will get somewhere legit. Um, and, uh, and he shared that with me, and it really meant a lot. You know, it meant a lot to... To, to have that experience, and I won't expound on that right now because that'll take a long time. But. So Leo has quit his job. Pam has quit her job, uh, both with the idea that they want to. <laughs> Don't high five. Nobody's going to tell us what to do. <laughs> both with the idea that they are going to follow the Lord regardless of the cost. Uh, it's a big deal. Pam was Pam's income was... Uh, a, a primary source, not the primary source, but a primary source in their income. Leo's income was the only, uh, except some side business that you do with t-shirts and stuff. Uh, and both of them are saying, I want to follow the Lord regardless of what it costs me. I'm going to jump into the fiery furnace. Um, Pam uh, came to me uh, about the children's pastor position here at Grace. Uh, but when did you first really want to become the children's pastor at Grace? I mean, I know this again, but they don't. It was when Pastor Mary stepped down. So well over almost four years ago. Yeah, and because there was a long transition between when Mary stepped down and when we hired Leo. I went to lunch with Pastor Ben. I was brand new. He was only taking Rory and I to lunch because we were brand new. And we were brand new. And he told me about this happening. And I think he was just discussing it to discuss it. And, uh, but everything in my heart wanted to say, hey, hey, I'd like to do that. Um, but I was brand new, so I kept quiet. And she was the new director of Mercy House, or new house parents at Mercy House. And I was concerned, I, I think rightfully so, but maybe not, how would they be able to balance just stepping into being Mercy House parents and becoming children's pastors at Grace? So Leo's quit, Pam's quit, nobody's got a job, so we figured, let's talk about this. And uh, when I talked to Leo in the office that day, you immediately suggested that we hire Pam. Why did you, why did you think we should do that? I was scared of what your reaction was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, because like, I'm a scary to, guy. Well, no, I'm just kidding. Um, Pam had been helping with us since the summer. As a matter of fact, I think for, I don't recall the dates, but for a couple of months, she actually ran. You guys don't know this, but she, she actually did more than I did back there for several months. Um, she was um, already like that, you know, pretty much doing the, the job, but then more importantly, um, I really had felt a long time ago, um, I think that you guys are aware, but that group back there is a lot of girls, like I think it's probably 80%, maybe more girls, and you guys keep having girls, what did the Flynn's just have? A girl. Oh my goodness, <laughs> and so anyhow, so I really had, I will say this, is that when all this stuff was happening, I totally didn't want to quit, and I didn't want to quit like oh my gosh, like what am I going to do for money? Because those of you that <laughs> know, I, that's the last thing I think about. But the Literally, <laughs> it's the last thing he thinks about. And I'll share with you in a Don't second. Don't go to lunch with him because he's going to forget about his money too. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to go to lunch? <laughs> um, so anyhow, the, the deal was that I, I really did feel like I still had a vision for it and I wanted to do all these things, but I felt out of place. Um, and I will say that, that immediately, like, it, it, there wasn't even, like, anything to think about. It wasn't a process. It wasn't anything. I, like, told Pastor Ben, like, straight out, like, Pam needs to do it. Done deal. I listened to Leo, clearly. <laughs> Not really. No, uh, <clears throat> I, I did take his suggestion with, with great thought. And I went to our council, 
and I began to explain everything to our council. And I said, here's what's going on. Uh, what, what is your thought? And any council members in the room that want to verify what transpired, you're welcome to do that. But everybody in the room said, this is the Lord. Leo stepping in. So Leo's not quitting. I want everybody here to know that. Leo's not leaving. He's transitioning out of children's ministry. I already and made a new office. <clears throat> he did actually already make a new office. Uh, whether we let him or not, he was making a new office. <laughs> Leo is going to become our outreach and evangelism pastor. And what the, yeah. <laughs> and what the council said in that day was, this is, this is a thus saith the Lord. Uh, I, I use the language, we're getting Leo to the right seat on the bus. And, and he is going to, he's going to do an incredible job. So baseball church uh, will be a, a primary focus for Leo moving forward. And it's now a ministry of Grace Community Church, which is awesome. We get to be part of all that's going to be happening with Leo and with baseball church. There's going to be opportunities for you to go and help serve at baseball church. One of the most incredible things that's transpired since Leo's made this step of faith is, and I'll, you can tell them, but you've got to tell them quickly about the World Series and the AA World Series. We have, um, every year the World Series is kind of like bid on, so cities throughout the country say, we'll do it, and then the people that are in charge of it have committees, and then they come and they say, how many baseball fields do you have? Is there hotels where you guys are? And it's a very long, complicated process. So the main World Series that you see on TV, like ESPN and all that type of stuff, that is, I mean, until somebody makes a multi-billion dollar investment, that's always going to be in New York, or they have it in Florida. There's basically three, and uh, one in New York, one in Pennsylvania, one in Florida. But um, those are small World Series. And even though you see them on TV, they probably have 40 to 50 baseball teams. The big World Series are the U-Trip World Series. And so the one in California has about 300 some odd teams. The, sing, the Majors World Series here in Texas was, this is like just unbelievable. It was awarded to Grapevine. And it's 300 some odd teams. And then like after we had made all these decisions, we were just sitting, I was in my office. I ran into Pastor Ben's when I got the notice. I got an email notification that Grapevine was awarded the AA World Series which is a less competitive World Series. So the teams are not as elite as the others, but the number changes from, from 200 to about 800. The, the, AAA, the AA World Series is over 600 teams. And so that means it also changes in a different respect. The Majors World Series are gonna be teams from Oklahoma and Tennessee and Kansas. And those are people that we're gonna see one time at the World Series and then we won't see them again because they're going to go back to Oklahoma. The AA World Series is going to be teams from Plano and Frisco and Keller and Ulysses and Waxahachie. And so these are people that are going to be more likely in our, in our crosshairs. All after Leo took this step of faith that I'm going to go after what the Lord's saying. I, I just, I can't help but believe this is the Lord setting him up setting up this ministry, and I'm really excited about it. And our new children's pastor is Pam Frank. <laughs> Again, when talking with the church council, nobody hesitated. There was no, there was no question. There was no, in fact, uh, I think Paul at council and uh, or Linda, I don't know, one of them came to me because I didn't give a name in council. They came to me and said, please tell me it's Pam. Because uh, I told them that there was somebody who had expressed interest. And our elders felt the exact same way. This is, this is the Lord setting up our children's ministry for long term with Pam, our, 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 our commitment and a need to focus on evangelism and outreach through Leo. And now we get to support them. And we need to support them, both of them. We need to step up. We need to help. Uh, whether it's filling classrooms or working in the children's ministry or helping with VBS or it's going out to the World Series and being some of the people that will just stand there and pray with people. I want to see us going like this. What just happened? God just did what? That's incredible. And I really believe it's going to be incredible. Um, 
I want to pray over you guys. Uh, but I want I wanted them to share, not because we needed to make an announcement. I could have just made an announcement. Leo's our evangelism pastor, and Pam's our children's pastor. I could have done it that way with a letter and an email and, you know, just made an announcement on Sunday morning. I wanted you to hear their stories because I wanted to encourage you. You can take your step of faith to go out after the dream that God has. And even if you don't know what's next, because neither one of them knew what was next, and yet God carried them every step of the way. They took the steps without knowing. I want to keep saying that. Without knowing, they, they, they made that leap of faith. And I want to encourage you to do that. So here's how we're going to close today. <clears throat> I'm going to pray for you. Okay. I'm going to pray for, for both of you. And then I want them to pray for you. You don't need my prayer. These are the ones that are taking this big, huge, giant leap step of faith. And they're just going to stand up here. We're, it's not going to be like a formal prayer. It's going to be if you want prayer, you just come up to the front, and um, they'll they will pray with you. They'll they'll wait as long as as long as you want to be here and wait for prayer. They will pray with you. Uh, if you are you just need that nudge to take that step or whatever it is, uh, I want them to pray with you today. So you stretch your hands towards them, and I'm going to pray for them in their new roles, and then we're going to let you pray for pray for them. Lord, I thank you for Pam and I. I thank you for Leo. I thank you that you brought Leo to us and you brought Pam to us, uh, really from both of them from California. Um, different venues in which how they got here, uh, but Lord, you they're not Texas born and raised. You brought them here for this season, for this time, and you have placed them here with purpose and with direction. And, and God, I believe that the future is really wonderful for for Grace Community Church, and it's really wonderful for Grace Community Church because of what Leo and what Pam are going to be leading. God, I pray over the evangelism and the outreach. God, we have preached love God and love people. I have preached it for six years. It's been part of every single message. Lord, it is who we're supposed to be. It's the first commandment, and the second is just like it. And that's what you said, Father. But we haven't necessarily modeled it with with staffing and with leadership. God, I pray that as Leo steps into this new role, that our congregation would see this and that they would follow, Father. They would not just follow at Baseball Church. I, baseball Church is great, and it's going to be incredible, and we're going to hear uh, incredible stories, incredible miracles of what you've done, but that they would see this isn't about just Baseball Church. This is about their own life and how they function in their own life, loving you and loving people. And Lord, I, I pray for Pam, and I pray for our children's ministry, that you would just begin to to grow our children's ministry, not in physical number, Lord, we want that as well, but that they would grow in depth of relationship with you. They would grow in depth of understanding of your word. They would grow in depth of, of relationship with their parents and with their siblings, Father. Lord, that Pam would, would teach them about mission and being missional, that she would teach them about the truth of, of knowing who they are in you, Father, and that that partnership with the parents of of our of our church body we would see a, a new generation rise up and love you and serve you and follow you and that you would just do incredible things in them and lord we pray for grace community church lord i know there are families in the room who who are surprised by this there will be people who will will receive the email later that will be surprised by this. God, I ask that you give them peace in the midst of this. I ask that this would not shake or rock in any way, but that they would feel as our council and our elders felt, yes, Lord, thus saith the Lord, this is a good thing. You have orchestrated this and you have uh, brought this to fruition. And God, I pray that our congregation, as we culminate this dream series, that they would recognize they have a dream and they would take the steps of faith regardless of what it means, that they would not cower back, they would not uh, shrink back, but that they would step forth, even if it means taking steps of faith like, I'm going to give up my job so I can go after this. I don't know that there's a bigger sacrifice than that in this life, other than death, Father. Lord, I pray that we would grasp you have a plan, you have a calling, and we are going to lay what's behind us down, and we are going to press forward to all that you have for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen, it's going to be an incredible week this week. Uh, we have fire station on Tuesday. We have the auction on Friday that Crystal just canceled all your plans so that you could come. Um, if you need prayer, do not leave without coming up and letting Pam or Leo pray for you, okay? Have a great week, everybody. Be blessed.